Okay, so we just talked about why it's important to try to communicate uncertainty. Um, and so for the second half of the session, we'll talk about how you actually do that and some standard graph types that we can use to try to communicate that uncertainty. Um, so when we're talking about a single number, um, like a column in a data set, if you have life expectancy or if you have weight, like animal weight. So we looked at this last time with the bar bar plots example um, or on session four. And so here, if we look at the average weight of cats and dogs, it looks identical. And so if we have a column with weights for cats and dogs, um, what we're doing is essentially collapsing that whole column into a single number, which is average of 40 pounds. But as we know, that's not actually accurate. Um, those single numbers are masking the whole distribution of weights for both cats and dogs there. And so when you have you know, single variables, you rarely want to collapse them down into a single number. Um, because one, you have to choose what single number you want to show. Um, you can show the average, you can show the median, you can show different percentiles, um, you can show the standard deviation. If you're just gonna collapse it to one number, which one of those is the best? Who knows? Um, so why not just show a ton of different numbers and try to communicate that uncertainty better? Um, so the general guidelines when we're looking at, looking at a single variable or a single column, is to avoid collapsing things down into a single number. Um, there are specific graphical methods we can use to show uncertainty in those single columns. Um, we can look at uncertainty across multiple variables, um, and we can even show uncertainty when we're looking at regression models and simulations and other kind of core statistical analyses. Um, so what we're gonna do for the rest of our session here is look at specific ways that we can communicate uncertainty and visualize an entire distribution of a single variable and multiple variables. Um, so one of the most common ways of looking at a single variable is with a histogram. And last week you drew a few of these histograms in different problem sets, um, mostly because geom histogram is fairly easy to use. Um, but today we'll show a few specific guidelines that you need to remember when you're using histograms. Um, the way histograms work is they essentially take your data and they put it into buckets or and yeah, they make buckets out of this or bins. And so it essentially shows how many rows in your data set fit within this bucket. So if, if we look at this, this is the Gapminder data set that we keep using because it's built into R essentially. Um, so if we look here with life expectancy, there's a bucket here around 40. I think it goes from like 39.5 to 41.5. And so there are um, two countries that have life expectancies in that range. If we come over here, there are almost 15 countries that have life expectancies that are like 72-ish. So that's what, what this is showing is just the count of the number of rows that are within that bucket or within that bin. Um, when you use histograms, um, R will always yell at you if you don't tell it how many bins you should have or how wide the bins should be. Um, and there's no official rule for what makes a good bin width. So you could set this bin width here, this is 0.2. That means every one of these bars um, goes from like 40 to 40.2 and then 40.2 to 40.4 and then 40.4 to 40.6, etc. Those are really, really narrow bins. And so as a result, um, you have these tiny bars and most of them are down at one. Sometimes you get two countries that have life expectancies in that tiny bandwidth um, and you have one bin that has six that there just happen to be six countries that are around 70 ish but it's going to be like 70 to 70.2 somewhere right in that narrow band so you don't want to have the bins too narrow because that's really hard to see any stories you don't want them too wide um, in this case this is bin width of 50 so that means it's going from 25 to 75 and then 75 to 125 years um, and so there are 100-ish countries between 25 and 75 and only 30-ish um, that are between 75 and 125. And that's misleading because guess how many have life expectancies of 125? Zero. Um, but it's showing it because we made the bin so wide. Um, and so this is one version of kind of a good bin width here. This is every column here represents two years. So this is from 39 to 41, and then 43 to 45, et cetera. Um, and so that, that's one version. You could also maybe do every five years. That would potentially look good. Maybe every 10 years. 
Um, this is entirely up to you. You just have to choose whatever bin width looks good for the story you're trying to tell and the uncertainty you're trying to tell about that um, distribution of variables there. Um, some general tips when you're using histograms. One helpful thing is if you add color equals white or color equals something, that will add a border to each of the bars and it'll make it easier to read. Um, one difference between column charts or bar charts and histograms is when you're working with columns, there's a big gap in between each of the columns. And that's by design. When you're showing like a column chart, you're generally showing categories along the x-axis. And see, so with like the Lord of the Rings data, we had um, kind of the different groups of, of races or um, films or genders. Um, and so you wanted to have those separate because they were categories. Um, with histograms, these aren't categories. This is a continuous variable that we've kind of cut up into categories. And so we want them side by side. We don't want to have gaps between them. But it is helpful to kind of see where the cuts are. And so having these white lines here does help read, help improve that readability. Like if you compare here, this like you can kind of tell that there's different buckets here, um, but it's really just kind of a blob of gray. But as soon as we add those lines, it makes it a lot easier to see. Another, another thing you can do is you can tell it to have a specific boundary for one of the bars and it'll have all of the other bars line up with that. And that's helpful because by default, um, for whatever reason, R chooses to put the middle of these main numbers in those bins. And so if you want, so this bin width here is, bin width is five, I think. Yeah, from 60 to 70, there's two, um, two bars here. But the issue is, that this bar here does not mean from 60 to 65. It means from 67.5 or 57.5 to 62.5, um, which is kind of a, a weirder way of thinking about the bin. And so here, if we say boundary equals 50, that forces one of the bars to start at 50. And so now this, this, uh, this bucket here goes from 50 to 55 and then 55 to 60. You don't have to choose 50. That was just one of the numbers. All you have to do is specify a single number. So I could have said 80. I could have said zero. That's just going to align the bars. One of the bars is going to be aligned at that number, and everything else will follow after. And so it's, it's good practice to make boundaries logical, um, especially if you're trying to have kind of a public version of this. I don't do it if I'm just trying to see what the, data, what the shape of the data is. Um, so I'll just say geom histogram and look at it this way. But then when I want to make an, an actual report or publish this thing, I will set the boundaries so it's a lot more interpretable for people reading this. And so it's a good thing to do um, when you're dealing with histograms. Another way of looking at uncertainty is this is kind of a super histogram. It's called a density plot, um, where before what we did is we took, um, we counted how many rows were in each of these bins here. Um, what density plots do is they use calculus to essentially make bins that are infinitely tiny, just tiny slices. Um, and instead of getting counts, because we kind of got that, if you look back to here, we had tiny slices of, of bin widths here, um, but there's big spaces in between them, and so this wasn't super helpful. Um, but if we use calculus on this, um, calculus gives you the area under the curve. This whole curve right here, if you add up all of these tiny slices, it's going to add up to one. And this is essentially the probability along, if you look at this line, every point along this line is the probability that you will find life expectancy of 60 or of 70 or of 75 within this whole distribution here. And so that's what this density is showing. This point three means this exact point right there at 70 or 69.3 or whatever, there's a 3% chance of seeing a 69.3. And then a 3.01% chance of seeing a 69.4. Um, and so that, like, if you add up this whole thing, there's a 100% chance of seeing some life expectancy, um, but it varies along this distribution. And so this is essentially a very, very smooth version of a histogram that is cut up into infinite tiny buckets. Um, histograms are popular. Klaus Wilkie mentioned this. They're popular because you can do them by hand. And so statisticians have been doing these for hundreds of years. Density plots require computers um, to figure out all of the fancy calculus equations to get that curvy line. And so they're they're fairly popular now. You'll see this. This like we have the flattening the curve example for the pandemic. That is a, a density plot. Um, but 
Um, so it's, it's generally a good idea to mix the two, to do a histogram that will give you kind of a chunky view of your data, um, but then do a density plot, and that will show you a more smoother view of your data in the shape of the, var of the variable. Um, you can change different options with these density plots, and Klaus Wilkie explained this in his chapter here. Um, and it's really just things that you have to manipulate the calculus with. Um, so one thing is called the bandwidth, which is um, how R figures out how curvy the lines should be. It looks at kind of a moving window as it's moving across. And so if you have a bandwidth of one, it's going to be looking kind of every year, trying to figure out the, the shape of the data within those years. And so with, in this case, if we use a bandwidth of one, it's going to get really bumpy because that's kind of a narrow window. If we use a giant bandwidth like 10, that's looking like at the whole range of 40 to 50 and then 50 to 60 and using kind of that big window to draw out the calculus shape there. And so that doesn't really represent our data very well. That's just a giant blob and it's not super helpful. Um, often I just stick with the default bandwidth, which is some fancy algorithm that R uses to figure it out. Notice how it's not even a number. It's this NRD0, which is the name of some algorithm that kind of tries to figure out the ideal bandwidth. Um, I'm generally just happy doing that. There are some situations where you might want to switch the bandwidths, but I rarely do it um, in practice because most of the time it's just for like a, vi a, a quick visualization. Or if I'm trying to do a published visualization, I don't care about tiny, tiny differences if I switch the bandwidth from like seven to eight. Um, it's really just kind of get to help get the gist of the shape of the data, not try to find actual scientific differences between them. Um, you can also change the kernel, which is uh, another calculus thing that happens behind the scenes to figure out the shape of this data. The default kernel is this Gaussian data, or the Gaussian kernel, and it works great. Um, there's a similar one called the Epinechnikov kernel, which is named after uh, some Russian scientist. It's a slightly different shape than a normal curve, which is the Gaussian, and so you can see it's kind of more bumpy neat but again like the difference between this and this if you publish those like you can see that it's kind of a little bit more uncertain and a little bit more bumpy there but that's all like it still has a peak so stick with gaussian because it's easy um, you can also use rectangular kernels which won't do curvy stuff it'll do kind of straight lines and so there's a lot bumpier um looks cool i guess um, if you really care about, like, if you're trying to measure the differences between two distributions of something, then you're going to care about which kernel you're using. If you're just trying to show the shape of the data, you're going to try, you're going to choose the kernel and the bandwidth that you know make the the best looking shape for the thing that you're trying to tell the story about. So that's density plots. Next, we have box plots, um, which, if you've taken a statistics class, you've hopefully seen these before. Um, these are cool, again, because um, they're easy to draw with uh, draw by hand without computers. Um, these were invented hundreds of years ago because you can get specific numbers out of a column of data, and then you can just make a picture of it, and it works well. Um, the way you do it in R is you have just an X variable or a Y variable if you want it to go up and down, and you just use G on box plot. Um, the way this thing works, here's this nifty little guide here. The line in the middle of the box is the median of your variable. Um, the edges of the box are the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, or the first quartile and the third quartile. This whole width of the box is something called the interquartile range. And you use that to determine kind of the minimum and the maximum. These aren't the true minimum and maximum. It's really just the 75th percent or the 75th percentile plus. 1.5 times the interquartile range. And so if you have points that are beyond that maximum, those are considered outliers. They're super far out from kind of the main range of the data. This is the maximum of the range of the data. And if you have points that are way out there, they're considered outliers. In this case, this is the, the cars miles per gallon data set. There are no outliers down on this direction. Um, there are no minimum outliers. So that's just the nature of this data. But often you'll have data that have tiny outliers and giant outliers, and this is just kind of a way of defining it formally as an outlier is something that is far away from the 75th percentile plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Again, you don't need to know the specifics of this for this class. Um, this is just a way of quickly showing if there are differences in medians across a whole bunch of different variables 
or if there are big outliers you have to worry about. That's kind of the general way you use box plots. Um, a similar version to a box plot is a violin plot, which is a density plot um, that is then uh, rotated and then flipped and mirrored. And so if you look here, this is actually our density plot that we were using before, but now there are two density plots side by side like this. And then that line in the middle isn't part of the violin plot. That was actually me adding a box plot on top of it. Um, it's often helpful to have both of those things, to have multiple layers of information. So this is helpful because it shows you the median right here. There's your set, or 75th percent or 75th percentile, 25th percentile. There's the minimum, there's the maximum, and you can see the shape of the data as well. So it's showing you both things there, um, which, is, which is helpful. Um, there's kind of been a backlash over the past couple of years um, for the usefulness of violin plots. If you search for XKCD violin plots, you'll see a fun comic showing one reason why um, they're not the greatest um, because they're easily misinterpretable and they they, they kind of look cool, I guess, but there are other ways of communicating that information instead of having kind of a double density plot there. And so violin plots are cool, but you can do better things. Um, so those are all single variable things. We can also look at the, the distribution of a single variable across another variable in our data set, across different groups. And so to do that, all we have to do with ggplot code is we just add another aesthetic. And so we can fill by one of the variables, or we can color by one of the variables, or we can facet by one of the variables. So if we go back to our gapminder data, um, here's our distribution of life expectancy, but then we fill it by continent. And so we have five different continents here. And so we can theoretically see five different distributions of life expectancy for each continent. Um, filling by a variable with a histogram like this is actually like really bad um, because good luck interpreting that. I like Again, they don't share the same baseline down here at zero. So it's really hard to tell what is actually going on in any of these graphs here because they're all just kind of stacked up on top of each other. So one thing you can do is you can keep that fill because we want each of the bars to be a different color for the different continent, continents, but we can also facet. And so here, that's that same histogram, but instead of all overlaid on top of on top of each other in one plot, now we have five subplots, one for each of the continents, and this is a lot more interpretable. Um, if we wanted to be super fancy, we could change this so it's only in one column, so we can compare from top to bottom um, what the distributions look like, and so we'd be able to see like Europe is definitely kind of on the high end, Africa is down on the low end, Asia is kind of in the middle. These two countries in Oceania, that's uh, Australia and New Zealand, they have high life expectancy. Um, and so we could make comparisons across these different continents um, a lot easier than this thing. So you'll rarely ever want to do something like this um, because it's uninterpretable. So you generally want to facet. Um, one thing that Klaus Wilkie also showed was a pyramid histogram. Um, you may have seen these with like, um, showing like ages in a country so you can see the number of old people down to the number of young people and then down to the number of babies something like that um, in r you can't make these with the regular histogram geom you have to kind of do it by hand um, with geom call so if you look at this code here it's kind of cool code um, this is adapted from what uh, klaus wilkie did in his um, chapter um, so we're taking the gapminder data set only looking at 2002 um, we make a, a new variable because we just want to show two distributions. So we say if continent is Africa, then make this variable say Africa. Otherwise, have it say not Africa. So instead of doing five different continents, we're essentially doing two, Africa and not Africa. Then we have to make a new variable for our own buckets. Um, geom histogram will figure out those buckets for us. Um, but because we're not using geom histogram, we have to invent our own. And so there's a function in R called cut and it will cut a column in, or the values in a column into specific buckets or specific bins. So we're gonna cut life expectancy and we're gonna use these as kind of the breaks. And so the sequence function says, start at 30, go to 90, and essentially make a number every five numbers. So it's gonna go 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, et cetera. Um, if we change this by a number to 10, then it'd go 30, 40, 50, 60. If we change it to one, it'd go 30, 31, 32, 33, etc. So this is essentially making 
the buckets for us. And so if there was a row in our data set that the life expectancy was 52, it would be in the 50 to 55 bucket. If the life expectancy was 68, it would be in the 65 to 70 bucket. Um, then, because we have that column that shows the bucket numbers, we can group by continent or group by Africa and group by buckets, and then get the total number of things in each continent in each bucket. And then when we plot this, we have on the y-axis, we have our buckets, which you can see here. These are the automatically made ones, so 80 to 85, 75 to 80, 70 to 75, etc. On the x-axis, instead of just saying total, we do this, this fun if-else statement here, and we say if the continent that we're plotting is in Africa, plot the total. Otherwise, plot the negative total. And that's what makes it go this way versus this way. Um, because this is the positive total, that's the negative total. And so that's how we can get that cool back-to-back -back, um, plot here. And then we fill it by the Africa continent. And so by doing that, it's kind of a more roundabout process. We have to create the buckets ourselves. Um, but we can create this cool histogram here, um, showing two different distributions side by side um, directly here. Instead of having two facets side by side, this is in one plot and it, it, it's cool. It works well. So that, that's another cool thing you can do. Um, you can also show multiple densities instead of multiple histograms. Um, this is um, the, the life expectancy. I got rid of Oceania because it only has two observations and there's not enough data there to do all of the fancy calculus to get the curves and so it won't actually plot um, or if it does plot it plots as almost a straight line and messes up the plots so we got rid of it um, and so here uh, by setting this to be like halfway transparent you can see these different um, distributions of life expectancy for the different continents and so you can see africa down here you can see europe up here and the other continents in the middle and so that that's cool and you can see the overlap this can get really busy, especially if you have more than like four groups here. If you had like 20 groups and you all you overlaid them all here, you're not going to see much. So one way to avoid that is there's a package called GG Ridges that creates something called a ridge plot, which is basically the same as this, but with the density plots kind of staggered and and partially laid on top of each other. And so you get the four different densities here, but if you see like the Americas is on top of Asia and the tip of Asia is on top of Europe here. Um, had, if I shrink this down to make it not so tall, um, then Africa would be on top of here. And so they all kind of overlap on top of each other and it makes it easier to read compared to this. Um, an example of this in real life is this plot here. Um, this is the distribution of this political science variable called DW nominate which is an attempt of measuring ideology of members of Congress. Um, positive numbers of DW nominate indicate more conservative leaning policies and positions. Um, more negative numbers uh, represent more liberal um, positions. And it's not like the greatest measure, but it's a measure that exists. And so the cool thing about this is this uses ridge plots to show changes over time. And so you can see in 1963, um, this is Democrats and this is Republicans. Um, their DW nominate scores are fairly close together. There's some overlap. You have um, Republicans who take, conser or take uh, liberal positions. You have Democrats taking conservative positions. Um, but the cool thing about this is because we have so many ridge plots here, we can actually trace it over time. And we see that from the 1960s to 2013, um, the Democratic Party in Congress has basically remained the same um, ideologically while the conservative Republicans have, been, have become more and more conservative over time. And you can see that there's very little overlap nowadays between the two ideologically. And we can see that just with this cool ridge plot. This overlap disappears and this red side starts moving more and more out to the, to the right here. And so that's like a real live example of ridge plots and they're helpful. Um, a couple other examples. Um, if you want to show like a box plot, but also show the points that correspond to it, which is useful because we don't want to throw away all of that data. Um, there's a cool package called ggHalves that lets you do kind of a half geom. And so what we have here is on the left side, we have a half box plot. So there's the box plot side. And then on the right side, we have a half point. And so this is kind of a strip plot combined with a box plot in the same column here. And so you don't have the dots on top of the box plot like you would if you just said geom box plot and geom point. 
and they would be overlaid and you have, you'd have to make one of them semi-transparent so that it would, it would be visible. Um, with this, this forces them to be side by side within that continent column, which is pretty cool. Um, there are a few other geoms that come with it. You can do geom half violin. Um, so you can have like a violin plot on one side. Because it's a half violin, it's actually just a density plot. Um, because a violin plot is like a double density plot. And so one cool thing you can do is if you use a violin plot or a half violin plot and rotate this, you can create something called a rain cloud plot. Because here's the violin density thing and it looks like it's raining. It's a cutesy name. Um, but it's cool because like you can see the distribution here. You can even, we add it. So in this plot, I have half point, half box plot, and half violin, all three. So we see the distribution. We see the box plot with the median and the inner quartile range and the different percentiles. And then you can see the actual points underneath. And so it looks like it's raining, but we also have you know, a helpful shape of the distribution and helpful shape of the percentiles. And this is kind of like a super cool way of looking at your at your data. And so experiment with rain cloud plots. They're fun. Um, they're starting to become more popu popular in the wild. I have a paper under review right now where we use these rain cloud plots and it's like reviewers like super like it because it's cool. Um, they don't like other parts of the paper, but they like the graph. So maybe that will help them like the other parts. Um, some other examples of of showing uncertainty. So this is how you show uncertainty with one variable or two variables. So this is life expectancy across these different continents. But you can also show uncertainty when you're doing something like a regression model, where you have lots of different coefficients that um, as one thing moves up, something happens to your output variable or your outcome variable. Um, and so generally when you run a regression, you just get a whole bunch of coefficients with confidence intervals around them and standard errors. And typically you put those in a giant table and then hope that the reader can understand what's happening in the table. Um, an alternative to that is something called a coefficient plot, where this shows those same coefficients, um, but it has this is geom point range here, so there's the point, and then the range here shows the confidence interval. In this case, this is a Bayesian model, so it has the credible interval. So this is the 95% credible interval. So that point could be anywhere in that line there. Um, these points don't have credible intervals because, well, they do, they're just super, super tiny. Um, these have much wider credible intervals. And if you have kind of a reference line here at zero, these points down here, these coefficients, mean that um, because they're so far away and the credible interval doesn't cross zero, that is most likely a significant effect. It's not, it's significantly different from zero. It's most likely not a zero effect. Um, whereas this right here, this relative violent protest activity, at least in the alternative model, it crosses zero. And so it's probably not significant. Um, and you can get those kinds of stories here just through graphs. Um, and so this is becoming kind of a more popular approach of communicating the results of a regression is to do it graphically. You'll still include the table and put it in like the appendix or something so somebody can go look at the actual numbers. Um, but if you're just trying to understand which coefficients matter or which coefficients move in different directions, it's a lot easier to see it kind of graphically in a coefficient plot. And tomorrow we'll cover how to do this. It's fairly easy. There's just one function called tidy that will convert a regression model results into a data frame, and then you can plot it with geom point range. So it's, it's fairly easy. Um, it'll make it really cool when you're communicating model results in your, in your research. Um, here's another example of that um, with some other um, aesthetics mapped on here. So we still have the same geom point range here. Um, the shapes here are for um, different model types that I'm trying that were in this case, I'm looking at foreign NGOs and domestic NGOs and how they respond to um, government crackdown. Um, and so this is representing different data sets that I'm looking at, the triangle and the circle. Um, and then the color shows different models. Um, and so you can map c color and shape onto here, but it's also showing um, the coefficients all at once, which is cool. Um, if you get into Bayesian modeling, um, when you do a model, um, the coefficient that you get is not just a single point. You actually get a whole posterior distribution out of it. And you can show that whole posterior distribution. And so here, um, this is the same idea. This shows kind of the distribution of these different coefficients um, using geom point range, but it also shows the posterior, like the shape of the posterior distribution. So you can see how far away it is from zero. 
Um, if it crosses zero, um, you can see if there's any weird points or any weird peaks, if there's like a, a bimodal distribution in your posterior, um, that will show you a ton more information than just a single number in a table. So this is a good way of, of showing uncertainty in model estimates. Um, you can also show uncertainty in model effects. One of the most difficult things to do with multiple regression models, um, with simple regression models where you just have x is explaining variation in y, you can just plot that as a line um, because you just have, it's like y equals mx plus b from eighth grade math where you're drawing a line. You can show the relationship between two things. But as soon as you have multiple regression with multiple x's, you can't have a single line anymore um, because you have multiple dimensions and it's really hard. Um, so one thing you can do is if you hold some of those x's constant and only move one of your coefficients, then you can show the effect of moving that x on y as you move it to different levels of x. So that's what showing. That's what this plot is showing here. Um, this is some from some of my research. The CSRE means Civil Society Regulatory Environment. Um, so the higher that. Uh, yeah, the higher it is, the more um, safe it is for NGOs, um, and it's less restrictive. And so what this shows is, um, like, as protests increase in a country, the civil society regulatory environment changes. Um, and this is based on model results. And so we have nonviolent protests. As those go up, the civil society regulatory environment changes. As violent protests go up, the civil society regulatory environment also changes, but in the opposite direction. And we get confidence intervals around here. Um, and you can kind of actually visualize what happens in the model as you move your different coefficients up and down. And I'll show you how to make this in tomorrow's session as well. Um, this is also fairly easy. You just feed it a data set of, of the variable that you want to move up and down. And you feed it the averages of all of the other variables you want to hold constant. And it will show you the marginal effects as you move one thing up and down, which is cool. Um, finally, one other way of looking at this, this is from 538 as well, um, where they've been for, so this is also from their 2018 midterms, they were forecasting um, different results. And so what they did is they had like 10,000 different simulations and they plotted the uh, popular vote margin and the actual predicted uh, breakdown of the parties in the House of Representatives. Um, and so they colored this by the probability of that happening. So you can see the darker the color is, it was most probable that Democrat, Democrats would win the popular vote and win the House. Um, that was their most common outcome, and that's what happened in 2018 when the Democrats took the House. Um, but there, were, there was a possibility that um, Democrats would win the popular vote and Republicans would win the House. That's down in this corner here. Um, that didn't happen, but it was kind of a high, high possibility of that happening. And so all of these, these outcomes here, there, there, is, there was a possibility in 2018 that it could have been in this world where the Democrats controlled the House 320 to 115 and got a massive popular vote margin. But that only happened like a few times in their massive simulation. Um, but this is kind of a, a good way of showing all of their different simulation outcomes. This is the most likely area here because it's the darkest. It's a, it's a good way of trying to communicate the whole model outcome in different ways. And so that was kind of a, a whirlwind tour of different ways of looking at uncertainty in single variables and multiple variables and regression models and simulations and all sorts of things. Um, so if you head to the lesson and to the example and assignment for today, you'll get practice making these things and communicating uncertainty. So head on over.